We're going to talk about Hamlet now. Now, the matter here is the death of a king. This will be a theme for this entire course. What does it mean to kill a king? What are the consequences of usurpation? Now, in Richard II and Macbeth, which we will be reading later, those are about the usurpations and the death of kings, while Henry IV, parts one and two, and Henry V show its consequences. Now, we don't usually think of Hamlet as a political play because we focus on to be or not to be, but it's worth considering it as such. Take, for example, Richard II. He's aware he's about to lose his for kingdom. For heaven's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed. Some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. Richard realizes a king is not invincible that even his divine status is worth nothing. And if we think about the chronology of Hamlet and its various versions, with the first quarto representing a much earlier 1589 version of Hamlet, and the second quarto and first folio versions representing a later revision of that earlier version, then we can also recognize Shakespeare thinking about his earlier play about a murdered king, a king poisoned while sleeping. Now, unlike Richard II, where Richard's usurpation and murder will have consequences for the rest of the Henry plays, Hamlet's concern with politics is almost absent except for the two famous figures of Rosencrantz and Gilderstern. Rosencrantz and Gilderstern personalize the consequences of a king being killed for the little guy surrounding them. It's through the image of the Wheel of Fortune. King Claudius is worried that he may fall because of Hamlet hazard so near us as doth hourly grow out of his brow, right? He's, he's thinking of overthrowing him. That's, that's his fear. And Gilderstern replies, We will ourselves provide most holy and religious fear it is to keep those many, many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty. In other words, what he's saying is there are a lot of people who rely upon a king, Rosencrantz. The single and peculiar life means the sing the, the, each person in a kingdom, the single and peculiar life is bound with all the strength and armor of the mind to keep itself from noyance, to keep itself from problems. But much more, that spirit upon whose wheel or well-being or health depends and rests the lives of many. So, so many people are dependent on him, the king. The seas of majesty, the death of kings, dies not alone, but like a gulf, doth draw what's near it with it. It's almost like a whirlpool of, or a black hole, or it is a massy or huge wheel fixed on the summit of the highest mount, to whose huge spokes 10,000 lesser things are mortized and adjoined, which when it falls, each small annexment, petty consequence attends the boisterous ruin. Never alone did the king sigh, but with a general groan. Something bad happens to the king everybody suffers. In this image, the wheel of fortune is crushing everyone as it turns. Not just a king, but everyone else falls along with him. And we know that's going to happen to them as well. Remember, they're going to be two of Hamlet's victims. I also want to point out that the wheel of fortune also appears when Hamlet confronts his mother after killing Polonius. Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this, Hamlet. A bloody deed? 
almost as bad good mother as kill a king and marry with his brother. As kill a king? She doesn't understand. I, lady, it was my word. Then he looks over at Polonius. Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool. Farewell. I took thee for thy better. Take thy fortune. It also comes up with Hamlet with uh, Rosencrantz and Gilderstern. Excellent good friends, how dost thou? Gilderstern? Ah, Rosencrantz. Good lads, how do you both? Rosencrantz? As the indifferent children of the earth. Gildenstern? Happy in that we are not ever happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the very button. You know, we're not the highest point of fortune. It doesn't go, we're not at the top of fortune's wheel. Nor the soles of her shoes, Rosencrantz, neither, my lord, Hamlet. Then you live about her waist or in the middle of her favors. Gildenstern, faith, her privates we are. And this is kind of a, a joke because they're intimate friends with fortune. They're also privates in the sense of people with official duties for fortune, as well as, of course, her private parts. Hamlet. In the secret parts of fortune, oh, most true, she is a strumpet, it's a prostitute. What news? None, my lord, but the world's grown honest, Hamlet. Then is the doomsday near. But your news is not true. Let me question more in particular, what have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord? Denmark's a prison. The consequences of the usurpation of King Hamlet, and I'm talking about the older Hamlet, not our Hamlet, the young Hamlet of the first quarto, but Hamlet's father. It's curious that no political secession is even discussed in the play, except for the fact that something is rotten in Denmark. It is, however, externalized in the figure of a ghost. And a ghost will also appear in Macbeth too. It opens with Ross presenting him at their table. Please, your highness, to grace us with your royal company. Macbeth notices that all the seats are occupied. The table's full. Lennox, here's a place reserved, sir. It's an empty seat that's sitting next to him. Macbeth, where? Lennox, here, my good lord. What is it that moves your highness? In other words, he's like, his face changes. Macbeth, which of you have done this? Lords, what, my good lord? Macbeth, he, now he sees the ghost, right? Thou canst not see. Once you I... murder for the top spot, your position as king is just that, a position to be occupied by anyone. In the case of Macbeth, that position is represented by a chair both occupied and occupied. Now think about what Hamlet says about Polonius's body after Rosencrantz and Gilderstein try to bring him in. My lord, you must tell us where the body is and go with us to the king. Hamlet, the body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is a thing. A thing, my lord? Of nothing. Bring me to him. The king is a thing, not a person. A thing that is ultimately nothing. And that's a very unsettling thought. The king is just a position. He's not a person. And unfortunately, this idea is not developed in the play. It's not even a concern of the play. The king's position by the end of the play is a final vacancy that ends with everybody dead. Now what about the ghost? We know the ghost appears in armor. We'll talk about that in the next video. And that armor is associated with the victory over the king of Norway named Fortinbras. Now when he appears, they see the king in his martial stock because of the way he walks like a soldier. They see it as some sort of political prophecy. This bodes some strange eruption to our state. They even ask the ghost for some sort of prophecy. Speak to me, if thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily foreknowing may avoid. In other words, do you know something about the fate of our country so that we can avoid it? Oh, speak. We know that they're buying arms, cannons, building ships, 
because after King Hamlet killed uh, King Fordenbras of Norway's, it seems that he took all its land. We see a whole political problem unfolding in the background. Now Denmark is strong, but now the young Fortinbras, the son of Norway's, the dead king, is dealing with his uncle, the new king of Norway, and wants his land back. We'll see these sort of fights play out in Richard II as well, when Richard has to take on Henry Bolingbroke's land. But it makes you wonder, shouldn't young Hamlet, dealing with his own uncle, the brother of the dead king, Shouldn't he want his land back too? Shouldn't he be the heir? The king is certainly worried about it. He even assures Hamlet. We pray you throw to earth this prevailing woe. Like, just get rid of all your upset depression. And think of us as of a father. For let the world take note. This is obviously an announcement to everyone in court. You are the most immediate to our throne. In other words, you are the heir to me. And with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart toward you. I love you like a father. King Claudius can't help but think that Hamlet may be brooding about his throne. Because there's always a political problem when it comes to dead kings and their successors. But what's the difference between young Fortinbras and young Hamlet? Action. Hamlet never acts. But what if Gertrude the Queen has a child? And think about this. The murderous usurper doesn't send his stepson back to school, but wants to keep him home. Why? Well, to keep him closer. This works better in Q1, because in Q1 it's a young Hamlet. He's a teenager. In the later, more standard version of Hamlet, he's much older. But he wants to keep him close. Why? To develop him into a good king? But you'll notice in Henry IV Part One, the usurper King Henry also has to worry about his son. But in that play, the dynamic is different. The prince, Hal, is a bum, while the Lord of Northumberland has a son like young Fortinbras who's named Hotspur. Westmoreland is praising Hotspur for capturing a bunch of guys, and he says, it is a conquest for a prince to boast of. And the king, Henry IV, is depressed about it because his son's a bum. Yeah, there thou makest me sad and makest me sin in envy that my lord Northumberland should be the father to so blessed a son, a son who is the theme of honor's tongue. In other words, when, when honor speaks, she thinks of Northumberland's son, Hotspur, amongst a grove, the very straightest plant, who is sweet fortune's minion or favorite and her pride, whilst I, by looking on the praise of him, See riot and dishonor stain the brow of my young Harry. Unfortunately for Hotspur, and fortunately for Hal or Harry, Fortune's favorite son becomes unfavored as one falls and the other rises. But what about Hamlet? Fortune's wheel does not just turn. It will grind them all to the ground, like Rosencrantz and Gilderstein fears, with the body count that totals to nine. When young Fortinbras finally appears at the end of the play, there's no one there to rule. All the power players are dead. This leaves the position of king open, but also think of the end of Beowulf, which has its own dark ending about the reign of kings. You can imagine how Hamlet ends with a war between Poland, Norway, and England invading Denmark. All right, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell. Those interested in investigating the first quarto as a possible early version of Hamlet should look at these two books, both published in 2014.